Hi guys, welcome to the Never Too Much Crime channel. My name is Amaya and I'm here for you every week with a new true crime story. If you love true crime as much as I do, let's get on with today's case. And today's story is about Stacy Caster. Stacy Caster was born on July 24th, 1967, Clay, New York. I couldn't find any information about her like growing up as a kid. I like to, to search about like their upbringing and how they were raised. We're gonna talk about her first husband first. I know when you hear this story, they always do the second husband and then they go to the first. So let's move on. Stacy met her first husband, Michael Wallace, when she was 17 in 1985. They got married on April 7th, 1990 and had two daughters, Ashley and Bree. Stacy worked at an ambulance dispatch company. Michael was a mechanic. The family was struggling financially, but they were very close with their children. But not everything is what it seems. Their marriage was falling apart according to Stacy, and he also had a drug problem. Michael had a very close relationship with his daughter, Brie. There was a lot of favoritism going on in the family. Stacy explained that it really hurt Ashley's feelings. There were other problems in the marriage, including affairs. Stacy started talking to her friends about getting a divorce. This was around Christmas time. Stacy didn't want to get a divorce during Christmas time because of the kids. She didn't want to upset her kids. So she told herself that she would wait until the next year. To divorce him. On December of 1999, Michael became very ill. He was coughing a lot, he was swollen, he couldn't talk properly or walk properly. He was always on the couch. He really had a hard time. He was also vomiting all over the place. He was still sick over the holidays and his family told him to seek medical help. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to do so and died on January 11th, 2000. Ashley was alone at the time of her father's death and she blamed herself for why he died. Ashley thought that her father was making playful faces, but really he was having a heart attack in front of her. Now that we know that his cause of death was a heart attack, you know when someone passes away and they have the option to have like an autopsy report? Stacy, on the other hand, she said no to an autopsy report. She also collected a $50,000 life insurance policy. She used that money to pay the funeral expenses and took her kids to Disney World. She claimed that Michael had medical problems in the past, but he didn't. Police started to dig a little bit deeper into Michael's death eventually. Detective Spinelli had a gut feeling that Michael had antifreeze in his body. We're gonna get into that later on. Investigators felt like the only way to get Stacy arrested was to have Michael's body exhumed. September 2007, the detectives get an order to dig up Michael's grave. Once they tested Michael's body, they found that he had antifreeze crystals formed in his organs. When you drink antifreeze, even when you die, the crystals formulate into your organs and they never go away. You can't get rid of them. So how is this connected to our second husband? Stacy will marry David Castor on August 16th, 2003. Her new husband, he was an owner of an air conditioning and repair company. He also had a son from a previous marriage, David Jr. David was described as a very hardworking man. Ashley, Stacy's daughter, talked about how she didn't like David at first. David said that he didn't want to be there for them or be there as a father figure. He was very difficult with the kids, very strict. You know, you do what I say or else. At first, we really didn't like him. He said he didn't want to be our father and he didn't want any part of being a father. He already had his kids and he didn't want more. So there was tension? There was, but half the time it was brought on by him. David was difficult with the kids. He expected them to do everything that he said without question. And being my children, they questioned everything. On August 2005, David wanted to celebrate their anniversary. Stacy didn't want to leave Bree alone in the house. And Ashley was working at that time. This is how their argument started. The argument lasted for about seven hours. In the garage, Stacy said that David got extremely upset, took the bottle of alcohol and went into his room and locked himself in and didn't come out at all. She started talking to her friends to get advice on what to do and Stacy's friends, one of them, encouraged her to leave the house and go to her house. Stacy was very distraught. She figured that David was sleeping in the room. She heard him snoring. She would go back and forth into the house to make sure that he was okay. On August 22nd, 2005, around 2 p.m., Stacy called the police. David wasn't responding to his cell phone. She noticed that her husband didn't show up to work. She explained that he was depressed. Sergeant Robert kicked the door in when he arrived at their home. David was spotted dead in the bedroom. On his nightstand, there was a half cup of a green liquid 
that had juice in it, a brandy bottle and a cranberry juice bottle. Underneath the bed, a bottle of antifreeze was found with the top missing. Police also found a turkey baster in the garbage. It still had liquid inside of it and you could smell the alcohol. They believed that suicide was possible and Stacy was implying over the phone call that he was depressed and that's why he locked himself in the room. According to police, Stacy was very sad about the death of her husband. She was screaming the whole time and yelling. Stacy calls her daughter Ashley to update her about David's death. Ashley was very shocked. She had no idea that he was depressed. Um, she didn't think that he was capable of committing suicide. It was all shocking to her. At first glance, the police did rule this as a suicide, but with further investigation, when they discovered the antifreeze and the turkey baster, Detective Dominic Spinelli wasn't buying it. When David was found dead in the bedroom, he was naked. They were saying how it's very rare for a person to take their own life when they're naked. It's just very bizarre. So they ran some tests to see if they could find any fingerprints. The glass cup with the antifreeze in it had three fingerprints and they were all Stacy's. Detective Spinelli explained how Stacy was holding the cup. She was holding the cup like from the bottom and that's how her fingerprints were on the cup. Police started to notice what kind of drinks David was drinking. They were all feminine drinks, you know, apricot brandy, diet cranberry juice. He also had a shotgun under his bed. That really confused police. If he really wanted to take his own life, he could have went under the bed and got the shotgun. Why would he poison himself? Why go through a slow, painful death? They found David's DNA in the turkey baster. To police, this was also odd. The turkey baster was found in the garbage. How was David able to commit suicide and then go back into another room and throw the turkey baster in the garbage. It didn't add up. Antifreeze is capable of kidney failure, liver failure, and heart failure. David's ex-wife Janice contacted the police. She didn't believe for a second that David would take his own life. It was very unlike him. Police digged a little bit deeper into the investigation and found a will. On the will, David explained that Stacy and her kids will get everything while his other son, David Jr., doesn't get anything. It led David Jr. believing that his father didn't want anything to do with him. But the will was fake. Stacy forged the will so that she can get all the money and everything. $45,000 to be exact. Do you know what I can do with $45,000 right now? I can get myself an apartment. I can invest in that money. Like that's, that's money, that's money. She used the money very quickly to renovate the house. Investigators started to get suspicious of how she was spending the money so quickly and how Stacy was acting. Police started to suspect that she had something to do with the murder of her husband. Police had to prove that she was actually guilty first. Investigators started to shift their focus on how David died. Detective Spinelli wanted to interview her first husband. Now remember, her first husband, Michael Wallace, is dead. They didn't know this. So when they were searching and trying to ask Michael Wallace questions, that's when they realize, oh, we can't contact him, he's dead. They locate where he's buried. He had his own headstone that had his name on it and next to it was Stacy's name so that when she passes away, she would be buried next to him. David's headstone was right next to her first husband's headstone. Police, they found this odd. Why would you have two of your dead husbands buried next to each other? It is, it's extremely weird. Remember when I was talking about her first husband, Michael, and they had to exhume his body on September 5th, 2007, and how they found the antifreeze crystals in his organs. Two days later, on September 7th, 2007, police question Stacy. They tell her, hey, the investigation is not closed yet. They explain Stacy's behavior throughout the whole questioning. She was pacing back and forth. She was very nervous. She was surprised that the police were questioning her again. She thought that this whole thing was over. She confesses to killing David by slipping up to Detective Spinelli. When he asked her, he showed her a picture and he asked her which cup you poured the cranberry juice in. She almost says antifreeze. I said, uh, Stacy, there were two glasses sitting on the nightstand. You say that you poured him some cranberry juice at one point, right? She said, yes. And I said, I'm gonna show you a picture of those two glasses. 
I asked Stacy, do you remember which glass it was that you poured the cranberry juice in? And she looked at it and said, well, when I poured the antifree, I, uh, and then she stopped and said, I mean, I mean the cranberry juice. Like, like she realizes what she's just said. The detectives ordered to wiretap Stacy's house. Listening to phone calls, setting up cameras, observing her house, the grave sites of her husband's. They wanted to pay close attention to her behavior. The police already had so much evidence proving that Stacy did murder her husband. She started to panic when she finds out that police already dug up Michael Wallace's body and discovered the antifreeze. And it scares the little out of me because I didn't do this. Stacy in that week making a lot of calls. She was in distress. They think I did this. I don't believe for one second that they found antifreeze in Michael's body. I don't believe it. I recall Stacy saying something along the lines of, they did it, they actually did it, they exhumed them, they, they did it. Why they do that? Instead of this woman, you know, turning herself in, you wanna know what she does instead? No, you don't know what Stacy does. Well, I'll tell you what Stacy did. She created a plan to pin the murders on her daughter, Ashley. What a sick ass woman. You're gonna, <laughs> you're going to drag your daughter under the bus and pin the murders on her so you don't take no accountability for all the BS that you've done? On Ashley's first day of college, investigators end up showing up at her school to ask her questions about her father's death. They tell her that her dad was poisoned and that he didn't have a heart attack. Ashley called her mom to confront her about it. I was at school on Wednesday, my first day of college. I'm all excited. Two investigators show up and deliver her the news that her father didn't die of a heart attack. He died of antifreeze poisoning. I was like, then you're, you're lying because I knew that my dad had a heart attack. That's how it was. He had a heart attack. I left and went and called my mom. Hello? Mommy, they came to my freaking school. They came to your school? Are you okay? Um, I'm gonna be okay, but I'm really freaking out right now. I don't understand how they know I'm even gonna be here. Oh my God. That bastard came to your school. Stacy invited her daughter to have a drink together at the family home. On September 12, 2007, Stacy said that they were stressed out, they need to relax. Ashley agreed to it. Um, you know, that's her mom. She trusted her mom. To her, her mom was her best friend. The next day, Stacy invites Ashley to drink again. Ashley explains that her mom gave her this nasty drink and she didn't like it. At first, she did refuse, but eventually she drank it. Stacy mixes this, uh, you know, probably 12 ounce plastic cup. Ashley you know, caught up in the moment. This is so cool, this is neat. I, I wanna make my mom happy. She drinks it. The next morning, Bree finds Ashley's body passed out. Stacy calls 911. Ashley, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. This is not happening. There was a suicide note next to her. The note was Ashley's murder confession. Fatal painkillers and vodka were found in her system. She could have died if they didn't take her to the hospital sooner. When Ashley woke up, she was questioned by police about the suicide note. She said she only remembered her mom making her a drink. She told police that she didn't write the note and was confused about everything. She goes to see Ashley at the hospital. There's a police officer that's watching them. She sits on Ashley's bed and she tells Ashley that she's sorry and that she loves her. Then she leaves. The same day, she was charged for the murder of David Castor an attempted murder of Ashley. Stacy was shocked that she was being arrested. And I'm like, you're shocked? Why are you shocked? The police goes through Ashley's belongings. Some people believed that Ashley was actually the one that killed David. They interviewed Ashley's friends and they described her as being a hothead. She got angry very easily. Me personally, just because you have a bad temper doesn't make you a bad person or a killer. There's a lot of people that have bad tempers, but they're not harming people. Stacy's mother the whole time, still to this day, does not believe that Stacy had anything to do with those murders. She defended her daughter. She said that it was impossible for her daughter to be capable of doing such things. Now, hear me out. A lot of parents don't like to see their kids in a negative light, even though 
there was solid evidence that were pointing at Stacy for her mom to still continue to defend her child, which is understandable. But at the same time, it's kind of like, if my kid did something bad, I'm sorry. They did something bad and that's it. September 25th, 2008, the judge agrees that Michael Wallace's death could be submitted as evidence. Fitzpatrick, who prosecuted this case, was 100% sure that Stacy would be convicted. The trial begins on January 12, 2009. Stacy's computer was also searched. They found rough drafts of the letter that Ashley allegedly wrote or typed. Forensics put the puzzle pieces together and find out that Ashley did not type this note. This was Stacy. Ashley was in school around the time that Stacy was typing this suicide note. They believed that the suicide note was just a plan to murder her daughter. Stacy's defense team, attorneys Chuck Keller and Todd Smith, were trying to make Ashley the bad guy. They were trying to pin the whole thing on her. Her grandmother, Stacy's mother, even agreed that Ashley killed her father and stepfather. They brought up Ashley's father, Michael, having favoritism. He favored Brie over her. According to them, that was Ashley's motive. The fact that Michael Wallace considered Brie to be his princess with his nickname and this way of treating her bothered her. Did it bother you at all that your sister had a nickname from your father, uh, this princess, and you didn't? No. You didn't think that was a little bit unfair? No. The defense is presenting a motive for Ashley to have done this. Angry at her father for not being the favorite child and the way she was treated growing up. Angry at stepfather for disrupting the life that mom and two sisters had developed together. And then he moves on to that suicide. Her father had favoritism. She was jealous. She was angry. So she kills her dad. They even brought her own suicide note as evidence. But yeah, she wrote a suicide note to one of her ex-boyfriends, they broke up and she was very heartbroken about it at the time. And she was just angry and sad about, you know, the death of her dad and her stepdad. And she was just angry about a lot of things, which is understandable, that's valid. When Ashley went to the hospital, they were asking her like, oh, what did you take? You have drugs in your system. What drugs did you take? What's the next thing you remember? Waking up in the hospital with a detective asking me what I did. What did you drink? What did you do? What did you take? What did you write in that note? But I didn't know what he was talking about because I didn't write a note and I didn't take anything. It was difficult to pin everything on Ashley. That was like the only thing that they could throw at her at the time. The trial was four weeks long, 50 witnesses. They were trying to figure out if they wanted Stacy to go on the stand, but eventually last minute Stacy gets on the stand. They start questioning her about Michael. She says that she didn't kill him. Now, notice her body language and her face. When she first starts talking, it kind of sounds like she's about to cry. But if you pay attention, there's really no tears. She's not really crying. And then her mood changes. So once Fitzpatrick is like questioning her and he starts yelling at her, trying to get a rise out of her, you know, that was just his technique and what he did. You could tell that her face was very cold, very sinister in my opinion. I wanted to talk about Michael Wallace first because Michael Wallace was her true love. Did you love Michael? With all my heart, I still do. Now, Stacy, did you kill Michael? No, I did not. The next day, cross-examination happens. The next morning, it was Bill Fitzpatrick's turn to cross-examine Stacy Caster. Tell the jury when it is that Ashley had the opportunity to poison David Caster. Um, she was home alone with him on Friday afternoon. She, were... No, no, answer my question and be specific. Fitzpatrick clearly made a decision here that the way to go after Stacy Castor is to talk to her as if she's a murderer. You don't remember saying that? Who tried to frame and kill her own daughter. Did Ashley poison him? I did not poison him. When did Ashley poison him? I can't answer that question. Fitzpatrick is trying to get Stacy to confess to the murders. They brought out evidence of a recording from a phone call. Stacy was on the phone with a friend and in the background, you hear typing noises from a computer. She's writing this suicide note right then while talking to her friend. When we forensically examined the computer from the house, it corresponded perfectly with the time that the phone call was being made and Ashley was not in the house at the time. When Ashley went to school, Stacy was on the phone with her friend and she was typing that suicide note. You can hear the typing noises in the background. Now, Stacy lies and says that she doesn't remember being on a computer around that time, but she was. And Ashley was not home. 
at all. Again, it was impossible for Ashley to type that suicide note in the first place. She typed several different rough drafts of the suicide note to perfect it. Stacy remained calm the whole entire time. On February 5th, 2009, Stacy was found guilty of second degree murder for the death of David Castor and guilty for attempted murder in the second degree for trying to kill Ashley. I'm going to find a chart on Google so you guys can see the difference between first degree, second degree, and manslaughter, all of that. On March 5th, 2009, Stacy was sentenced to 51 years in prison. She was placed at Hills Correctional Facility for Women in Bedford Hills, New York. 51 years. I mean, I think she deserved it. My opinion, I think she did it. Now we're going to talk about rumors. The DA believed that Stacy also killed her father, Jerry Daniels. He died on February 22nd, 2002. You want to know why? Every time when she would visit her dad, she would bring him a can of soda. Also, I believe that when he passed away, she was going to get everything. She was going to get money. She was going to get a house and stuff like that. But what do you guys think? I think it's possible. I don't think this woman just killed two people like those two times. We know for a fact that her motive was money. Every time she killed her husband, she would collect them checks. She waited for a couple of years into the marriage so that she can get some money. April 24th, 2009, ABC aired a two hour 2020 special about this case. Ashley never spoke to her mother again after the trial. She never visited her mom. She never sent her mom letters. Nothing. Stacy would end up dead on June 11th, 2016. She died of a heart attack at the age of 48. Is that a coincidence? This case was turned into a lifetime movie called Poisoned Love, the Stacy Caster story. If you want to watch it, it's up to you. And that is the Stacy Caster story. Wow. That was a lot. There was a lot to unpack about this case. Man, this woman was crazy. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. Thank you guys for listening to this week's case. Thank you guys so much <laughs> for even listening to me at all. I'll see you guys next week with a new never too much true crime story. See you guys next week. Bye everybody.